So uh, let me get started. And what I would like to do today is in a sense, circle back to the very mundane of American politics, the fact that this is an election year and that we have been understandably not paying very much attention to it because the things that are happening in the world have really drawn our attention elsewhere. And on the other hand, that doesn't mean that the day-to-day -day of American politics is on pause or hold. In fact, it's continuing to progress. And I want to then, in a sense, put into dialogue the ordinary in American politics with the extraordinary that's happening in the world. So looking at the 2022 election year in light of the fact that we have a bunch of interesting <laughs> issues that are going to reverberate domestically. Is, uh, is somebody saying something? I'm not sure. No, okay. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone because uh, we're getting a little bit of background noise. And then whenever you have questions, of course, just unmute yourself and ask. So uh, the, the, the fundamental background to uh, the election uh, in an off year or a midterm year is the basic truism of American politics, which is that if a single party is incumbent in the way that the Democrats are right now, controlling the presidency and both houses of Congress, they tend to suffer setbacks in those midterm elections. And, and so historically speaking, assuming this is something resembling a normal election cycle, we should expect the Democrats to suffer losses. And given how narrow their hold is on Congress, 50-50 split in the Senate, a bare majority in the House of Representatives, we should expect all things equal that the Democrats might lose control of Congress. And, and having said that, I will then immediately jump to the current state of political play and start with Joe Biden's popularity rating. Of course, Biden is not on the ballot in 2022, but having said that, uh, he is uh, implicitly on the ballot in many of these congressional elections. Remember the entire House of Representatives and a third of the Senate is up for grabs, as are the governorships, the uh, state legislatures, local officials in many states and localities. And so uh, what will Biden's popularity do to the prospects for the Democrats? The first thing to look at is how popular or unpopular Biden is. And as you can see, he's not very popular at the moment. As a matter of fact, he's about as unpopular as a president has been at this period in their presidency during the post-war period. The only person who was more unpopular at this point in their presidency was Donald Trump. Biden is more unpopular than Carter or George H.W. Bush were two one-term presidents. And I want to take a minute to try to figure out why Biden is so unpopular. And, and, and so the first thing to notice is that he had a relatively long honeymoon, right, from January through late July of last year until uh, then his uh, approval rating really took a pretty drastic dip. And of course, that coincides with two things. One of them is the perceived mismanagement of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way in which that, if you will, pierced the halo of competence surrounding the Biden administration. Um, and uh, that is then compounded by the fact that Biden in his inaugural address had promised that vaccines would be available by July 4th. And he got pretty damn close to that in terms of uh, general availability for everybody who was eligible, but also that having those vaccines would then bring the pandemic under control. And as it turns out, the worst of the pandemic was still ahead of us and Biden's over promise on the 
efficacy of the vaccines. And, and, and to be clear here, it seems to me, the real issue is the rate at which the vaccine was taken by the population. I think Biden failed to anticipate how much resistance there would be, how much anti-vax um, energy there would be during a deadly pandemic, but it was there. And the result is that we remain in the grips of the pandemic, still vulnerable to the coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease that it causes. And that is also dragging his approval rating down. Now, the, the next way to look at 2022 is to look at the uh, more minute drawing of the electoral map, at least for Congress. And as of course we're aware, uh, 2020 was a census year. And so new maps for congressional districts had to be drawn before the 2022 elections could take place, reflecting what we learned about population shifts between and within states. And of course, the politics of gerrymandering of favoring the party in power. And one thing that you can see from this map is, is that the Republicans had a strong advantage and many people anticipated given their control of a large number of state governments, given their history of hyper-partisan gerrymandering in the past, that they would draw new lines that would give them still a greater advantage uh, in terms of uh, the being able to get a majority of representatives without getting a majority of the popular vote. And it turns out that that was not correct. And, and that if we compare uh, the bottom line here is the old maps. And as you can see, the Democrats are either strongly favored or slightly favored in uh, <laughs> basically this exactly the same number of districts uh, under the old maps and the new maps, whereas the Republicans were favored under a much larger number of districts under the old maps than they are under the new maps. I'm saying larger. I believe they've lost about eight safe seats as a result of the fact that the maps have been drawn, redrawn, and litigated. And I, I think that last thing is extremely important that at least 20 of these states are still in litigation around the districting process. And the map that we use in 2022 may be not the same as the map that we use in 2024, depending upon how that litigation turns out. But in 2022, the upshot of this is that in fact, there are more contested or toss up or highly competitive districts than there have been in the last decade. And obviously in a neutral environment, this then gives the Democrats an advantage. In the environment we're actually in, which is not a neutral environment, I think one of the things we will have to see is how strong the anti-democratic, anti-Biden headwind is. Uh, six months from now as we enter the November elections. We just don't know yet, but the, the interesting prospect that this map holds is that the Democrats might actually be able to do better than they would generally have done because the map is a little bit more favorable because they can make these contests local. And now I've put one more thing on my little uh, board here, and that is that now Justice Katanji Brown Jackson is Biden's first appointment to the Supreme Court and also the first ever African American woman appointed to the Supreme Court. And I'll just share with you very briefly, there's this literature in political science right now that suggests that one of the most important factors in determining what happens in particular in swing states and swing districts one of the key factors in districts that have a sizable African-American population is whether or not African-American women vote. And given that there are more highly competitive districts in 2022, given that Biden just appointed the first ever African-American woman to the Supreme Court, I think one of the interesting questions here is whether or not 
the Georgia model, the Stacey Abrams model might hold some prospects for better success in 2022 than we would normally anticipate. Having said all of that, let me now transition to what I think is the, the single most important factor in any American election. You remember the Bill Clinton mantra, it's the economy, stupid, right? Keep your focus on the economy if you want to understand what's happening in American electoral politics. And here the news is very ambivalent. And I'll start with the good news. And most of what I'm gonna say is about the bad news, but I don't wanna lose track of the fact that we have emerged from the pandemic recession in which 20 million jobs were lost in a flash in April of 2020. We've, we've emerged from the pandemic recession almost back to where we were before it, right? Almost every job that was lost has been recreated. The labor force participation rate is back to almost where it was. This is truly remarkable and much better than most of the rest of the world. And this then is affecting wages, affecting employment, affecting unionization at places like Amazon. Workers are feeling a little bit better, a little bit more confident, a little bit more in demand. And that indicates that the post-pandemic policies, the payroll protection plan, the stimulus plan, the uh, expenditures that are starting now on infrastructure under the Biden infrastructure bill have been successful in countering the drag that the pandemic put on the economy. So that's, I think, important to recognize and to recognize that in a sense, the American economy is the healthiest economy in the world right now in terms of employment, jobs creation, and that our policies get some credit for that. However, it is also the case that we are in a period of very high inflation. 8.5% is the most recent figure for the year over year inflation rate for uh, the consumer price index. And, and that is as high as it's been since the 1970s. And I'll say more about what inflation does to people's sense of economic well being in a moment, but, but very quickly, it creates profound uncertainty is the wage that I'm drawing today going to be able to cover my standard monthly expenses or not? Can I count on it covering them next month? If I can't count on them covering it covering them next month because it's going to have been eroded by inflation, then maybe I better not spend this month. Or maybe I just don't know how I'm going to make it through this and next month. That uncertainty is perhaps unique to inflation of all the kind of major negative economic phenomena that a modern economy suffers from. So I'm, I'm going to focus on inflation and what inflation is doing to our economy, where it's coming from as well. And I, I like this diagram because it shows the sources of inflation. You know I am not an economist, and so I don't want to speak with too much confidence on this topic. But having said that, if you, if you look at the major sources of where inflation seems to be coming from, two really stand out. And, and uh, this is uh, based on Bureau of Labor Statistics and calculated by a man named Matthew Klein who does uh, economic analysis. And he labels this COVID inflation and Putin inflation. And if we wanna talk about the kind of inflation caused by COVID, we have to talk about supply chains and particular shortages of goods that have resulted from supply chain problems. And then the scenario is that demand exceeds supply because the goods are no longer available in the quantities 
that we are used to them being available in. And the key illustration of this is motor vehicles. You can see this in dark blue here. And I would point you in particular to last spring, spring of 2021. And you can see, right, that the inflation rate for vehicles in general is very high and it's pushing the overall inflation rate up as well to around uh, 5% a year. Our goal usually is around 2% a year, so that's more than twice the rate of the inflation that we want. Why are vehicles so expensive? Well, we're having trouble getting chips out of Asia and automobiles are chip intensive. Though. Many of their components rely on chips. And so there are not as many new automobiles as we're used to there being. And some people who are having their vehicles break down or who want a new vehicle, therefore trying to buy used vehicles and both new and used vehicles go up dramatically in price, pushing inflation up overall. Now, that's one scenario. The other scenario is the energy scenario, right? And, and I'm sorry, the Putin inflation scenario. And the big driver here is energy cost. And of course, the number one component of energy cost is oil or petroleum-based product costs. And that's the light blue. And as you can see, that has absolutely skyrocketed in the spring of this year as the Russian invasion of the Ukraine has created a great deal of uncertainty surrounding oil supplies. People are unwilling to buy Russian oil. Russian oil sales are unable to go through because of the restrictions on Russian companies' ability to use the banks. And the result is, as you can see, a dramatic increase in energy costs. And, and so unfortunately, at the moment, we seem to have, in a sense, two independent pressures that are increasing inflation, the pandemic and the war. And I just want to note that, that in this diagram, one thing that is not apparently driving inflation is wages. And so one of the questions, and again, I'm not an economist, but it seems to me that's really important to sort out is how much did the Biden stimulus or the overall COVID stimulus contribute to this inflation. Based on what I'm seeing, it doesn't appear to me that it is a major factor. And I think that's important in part in terms of how we figure out how to respond in terms of policy to future scenarios. Also, how we apportion blame for the inflation. But Frankly, that's a kind of policy analyst wonky way of looking at things. Most people are not going to look at things that way. They're just going to figure out what this means for their bottom line. And uh, in this regard, a diagram published by Bloomberg, I think is very helpful. Um, and this breaks the population down into quintiles, 20% groups. And as you can see, right, the bottom quintile, this is going to cost them around a little bit over $2,000 a year to, to purchase the same stuff they purchased last year, this year will cost $2,000 more. And please note that the income for that bottom quintile is around 17,000. So this is more than a 10% pay cut or a 10% cut to your standard of living. That's what inflation is doing to people in terms of their pocketbook. And as you can see, as you get up into the higher income brackets, people who spend more are going to be more dramatically affected by inflation. The average American family is going to have to spend $5,200 more this year than last year due to inflation, right? And, and so again, your pocketbook, your standard of living is reduced by 5,000. This is affecting people's psychology and the standard uh, survey question here is, do you think you will be better off next year than you were last year? And as you can see, the light 
I guess it's the darker blue at the bottom. Those are people who think they're going to be much worse off. The yellow are people who think they're going to be somewhat worse off. You add them together and you're up very close to 40% of the population thinking they're going to be worse off next year than they were this year. And by the way, you look at the people who are about the same and now you're up to uh, over three quarters of the population. So less than one quarter of the population is anticipating that it's going to be better off next year. That's what inflation is doing to our economy. Let me, to, despite the very hot job market, and let me try to, to, to explain the way in which this is working right now. And I think this diagram is actually very revealing, right? And this shows uh, wages relative to where they would need to be to hold steady against inflation, right? And as you can see, in early 2020, there is a big spike in wages, right? Where wages go up from around 375 to around 400. What drives that is the supplemental unemployment insurance that is part of the COVID relief bills. And the fact that many people who were earning $380 a week are now getting $400 a week in unemployment relief. And as you can see, as that um, was phased out, people went back to work, but the wages they are getting right now are not keeping up with the cost of inflation. So although the job market is hot, wages are not keeping pace with inflation. Please note also the average U.S. worker is earning $381 a week. That is less than $20,000 a year. I think that's just worthwhile noting. And, and I want to move from the numbers to the human experience of this. And I think in doing that, the work of uh, Sendhal Maltahatan and uh, Shafir, Elhar Shafir, their book, Scarcity, which I've spoken with you about before. This is a psychologist and an economist collaborating to try to ascertain why Americans are experiencing greater scarcity, greater precariousness. Scarcity here means basically that the money that you make is inadequate to the cost of living that you believe you need to maintain. The subtitle of the book is The Science of Having Less and How It Defines Our Lives. And, and so on the psychological side of the experience of scarcity, there's an emotional dimension to this, right? Feeling economic precariousness increases anxiety increases stress, increases therefore aggression and resentment. And all of that together is in part accounted for by the fact that economic stress increases cortisol production, which is the body's major stress hormone, and that has both physical, physiological implications, as well as cognitive implications. And one of the things that the authors show through a variety of very interesting psychological experiments themselves and reviewing uh, the psychological research of others is that when you experience economic stress, you are less patient. You are also more aggressive and less good at problem solving. One of the things they say is that it narrows your cognitive bandwidth. You're in a fight or flight mode. You're obsessed with your economic stress and that makes it very difficult for you to uh, parent well, to be a good 
uh, economic agent to, to pursue a career, to be a good partner to your husband or wife. And so it's not just that people are having trouble making their ends meet at a human level, this tends to affect almost all of the major compartments in which we lead our lives and to drag down the quality of our life across all of those compartments. So let me now return briefly to the economics of this and, and, and to point out something that I think is really important to notice, which is that our policy toolkit for combating inflation is very limited. You might say it really only has one tool in it, and that tool is not a very effective tool. The tool that we tend to use to combat inflation is Federal Reserve interest rate hikes that, quote, tightens the money supply, right? You can think about this in terms of your credit card. If you tend to spend $1,000, a month on your credit card, you tend to pay it off over a couple months, you budget for the interest uh, over those couple months, and then all of a sudden you get the notice in the mail that I got the other day, your interest rate is going up, then you may spend a little bit less because you know you're gonna have to pay a little bit more. And frankly, many of us are not that rational in the use of our credit cards, but firms tend to be more calculative. They're looking at their cost of borrowing relative to their prospects of profit. And if their cost of borrowing goes up, that changes the calculus. They may borrow less, they may spend less, they may employ less. All of that is going to shrink the money supply so that the demand side of the equation goes down a little bit. And eventually the theory is that brings a new equilibrium while we're waiting for the supply side to catch up with the greater demand and brings inflation under control. Now, when we look at this historically, the basic conclusion we reach, and, and this is right, every inflationary period, every period in which the Fed has responded with increased interest rates, it doesn't work to bring inflation down. It may work to contain inflation. What the proponents of this policy would say in response is, well, you don't know how much worse inflation would have been if the Fed didn't raise interest rates. The fact that they kept the rate of inflation constant is maybe the sign of success. But having said that, the evidence is absolutely clear that inflation doesn't come down, or at least it hasn't historically, when the Fed raises interest rates. And given the story I've just told you, in which it's really exogenous shocks, it's the pandemic and the war that are causing shortcomings in our supply of critical goods like automobiles and energy, it's not surprising that I think many people are skeptical about the Fed's ability to contain inflation. Now, to be clear, most economists think that inflation is going to come down over the course of this year, right? And, and so we're at 8.5% now that it'll be back to, let us hope, 4 to 3% by the end of the year, and then next year coming into 2%. But please note that the other thing that Fed Reserve interest rate hikes do, the way in which they tighten the money supply is by contracting employment. And so coming into an election cycle, we should expect to see the job market cool off before inflation is tamed. And, and, and this is just another factor that I think we need to be thinking through as we think through what we should expect in the coming elections. Next thing to talk about briefly, and, and that is COVID. And we have not talked about the pandemic at length together very much recently. In part, that's because after this awful spike uh, in last winter, we have uh, seen it come under control and really 
reduced to a much less dangerous level. But having said all of that, let us notice that at this point, we are very close to 990,000 people having died from COVID. That means that almost everyone in America is connected to someone who has died either closely or loosely. And not only that, it means we're gonna to get to a million before the November elections. It's still the case that 500 people are dying a day. And it's not just the deaths, as awful as they are. It's the way in which COVID has impacted our lives, the, the, the lack of social connectivity, the people whose schooling has been interrupted, the people whose wedding plans have been put on hold, the parents who have not been able to see their children when their children are having their own children and so are not able to see their new grandchildren, right? That, that there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of frustration. So what's going on with the pandemic and, and how is this likely to play out over the course of the remainder of this year and into the coming years. And, and, and here I wanna point, first of all, to what I think is perhaps uh, the, the, the central failure of American policy uh, in dealing with the coronavirus, and that is the relatively low rate of vaccination we have. 66% of the population is fully vaccinated. We would need to get probably to 90% to really bring transmission under control. Now, some of this is happening through natural immunity because so many people contracted the virus in the winter. Um, and, and so it's not vaccinations alone. But nevertheless, if we want to really contain the spread of the coronavirus, as well as the mutations of the virus that tend to produce these new waves, the capacity of the virus to evade immunity, either naturally acquired or acquired through vaccination, we need higher rates of vaccination than we have. But this has become a culture war issue, right? And, and there are a large number of people who define their freedom at this point or define their political identity, perhaps their masculinity in terms of not getting vaccinated. And frankly, if this kind of spike and deaths approaching a million don't get people to change their minds about the vaccine, I'm not sure what will. And so I'm going to assume that we are going to remain at around two thirds of the population vaccinated, that we are going to continue to see mutations of the virus, that we're going to have more natural immunity as more people get the virus, but that in essence, we're not that different in coping with the coronavirus than we are in coping with the influenza virus that caused the pandemic of 1918, the Spanish flu so-called. What you can see is after uh, a very high rate of deaths in 1918, 1919, uh, approaching 200 deaths per 100,000. Um, the natural immunity began to set in, but what that meant is a seesawing back and forth for 20 years between endemic and pandemic. Endemic is where the virus is still transmitting, but the rate of transmission is controlled. It's in pockets. It's not society-wide. It's not uncontrolled mutation and spread. Pandemic, on the other hand, is uncontrolled mutation and spread. And as you can see, uh, practically every year from 1920 to the mid-1940s, there were pandemic outbreaks of the influenza virus until we finally got effective vaccination, widespread use of childhood vaccination, as well as herd immunity, in which event there were a few pandemics in the uh, years even after 
the vaccines and immunity had really very widely spread. And I'm sorry to say, but I suspect that this is our future with regards to the coronavirus as well. And again, the combination of the fatigue with what the virus is doing to us and what we have to do to contain its spread. You, you can see evidence of this fatigue in, in, in this diagram, how many people want to get back to life as usual. And that means having no coronavirus mandates or requirements. That was 20% of the population in February. It's up to 30% of the population now. How many people want to open up more but still have precautions? That was 30% in February. It's nearly 50% now. How many would like to keep precautions in place? 25% almost in February, down to 12% now, right? So public opinion is moving on this and it's moving in a less cautionary, less constrained direction. And because this is an election year and a democracy, politicians will respond to that public opinion. And that means that there will be fewer restrictions. That means in turn that there will be more transmission assuming the virus remains afoot. Now, to, to just notice the interaction of the first two things I'm talking with you about, the coronavirus is not just affecting our national mood, which it clearly is. I, I think about my students who are having uh, a major outbreak at Sarah Lawrence right now. And for my students who, who basically, you know, as far as they're concerned, their, you know, self-conscious life begins around 10 years ago, they're 20 years old, uh, about 10% of their conscious life has been consumed by the coronavirus pandemic. It's, I think, a lot easier for people our age to cope with when it's a much smaller portion of our overall life, when we're not at these critical developmental phases. We are not having to miss our graduations, our parties, our dating, et cetera, let us hope. And this then is dragging moods down across the country, but especially for younger people, it also has some lasting economic impacts. Two diagrams that show this. One of these has to do with flights to Asia, right? And, and you can see they fell off a cliff like the economy in early 2020. Of course, China and Asia were the initial hub of the coronavirus, but look at how long they stayed at this nadir, right? They really didn't start to come up at all until early spring of this year. And please note that these now are planned trips, not actually book trips. And given what's happening in China right now, I wonder how many of those planned trips are being canceled or postponed. Speaking of which, right, this which looks kind of like a, a, a galaxy of some kind, all those little yellow dots, those are container ships off the shores in the China Sea of China, right? And, and, and as you can see, there are thousands of them waiting either to deliver goods or to pick up goods. But as you know, Shanghai, a city of 25 million people is essentially on lockdown. More than 15 million people in state mandated isolation due to a surge in the coronavirus and, and the so-called Chinese model, the zero spread model for the coronavirus. Turns out it was quite successful for the first two years of the pandemic until the Omicron variant came along. The Sinovac, the, the Chinese vaccine, um, is not as effective as the MNRA vaccines, the, the Pfizer, the Moderna, et cetera, Johnson & Johnson as well. Um, and the result is that we now have unconstrained spread of the coronavirus in China. 
none of these container ships can get goods there or goods from China going elsewhere. This is going to amplify those supply chain problems and potentially the inflationary pressures will go up as a result. All right, final big issue that I want to talk about with regards to thinking about 2022 is the war in the Ukraine. And I'll be brief here. Um, as you can see, the Russians have essentially withdrawn from, this is the north and center of the Ukraine, to really focus their efforts on what appears to be an imminent invasion of the Donbass region of the Ukraine and the far east of the Ukraine. As they've withdrawn, the Ukrainian forces have, have regained control over a large number of towns, especially in the suburbs of Kyiv, and discovered awful atrocities rape, execution, kidnapping or hostage taking, etc. And so the pressure in the rest of the world to further sanction and isolate Russia has gone up. The Europeans are considering a oil embargo on Russian oil. That decision will not be made until after the uh, elections next week in France. And please note that there's a possibility that Marie Le Pen will win those elections, the far right national front candidate who has basically said, or I shouldn't say basically, been very public in saying that she opposes the oil sanctions and pitted the French working class who would pay more at the pump and already is angry about having to pay more at the pump due to Macron's earlier energy taxes, that uh, she would oppose the sanctions on Russia because of the way they would affect the French. And, and she is saying, we need to prioritize the French working class over the Ukrainians. If that happens, we have a major fracture in the currently successful coalition being built in NATO and the European Union against the Ukraine, especially with Biden's leadership. And, and so that's one aspect of, of the war. The other aspect is we can expect to see, I think, uh, very quickly, very uh, rapid escalation of conflict in this relatively narrow theater in the Donbass region. Um, and um, this, I think we should anticipate will look an awful lot like the battle for Mariupol. And uh, this map shows, right, that a month ago, although it was under siege, the Ukrainian forces had control over most of the city. Slowly but surely, the Russians have pushed in. And at the same time, a sustained aerial bombardment everywhere on the map that is red is a place where a building has been destroyed or damaged. As you can see, if you put your opera glasses on, many of these areas are residential areas. Many of the facilities that have been destroyed are civilian facilities. I think this is what we should expect is coming with the for the Donbass, right? Systematic destruction of any place that resists the Russian advances. And this is indicated by the leadership, the, the new general that the Russians have brought on board, the kinds of technology that they are bringing to their mounting areas and their general strategy. So that, right, means that this war is likely to be a protracted war. Please note that the Americans and NATO are arming the Ukrainians with increasingly heavy and sophisticated military. Please, I, I should say equipment, munitions. Please note that the Ukrainians have sunk the pride of the Black Sea Russian fleet the missile cruiser Moskva. And they've done it with missiles that mean that the Russians cannot get their fleet 
close to the shores of the south Ukraine the, by the Crimea where they have been bombarding the Ukrainians from. This is a major loss, a humiliating loss for the Russians. And I think one of the things we're seeing as we anticipate the next phase in the battle and continue to push heavier munitions into the Ukraine is that this is looking more and more like a proxy war. And I believe not only is it looking that way objectively, it's clearly the case that Vladimir Putin views it in that way, that this is not just a war between the Russians and the Ukrainians, this is a war between Russia and NATO, with NATO using the Ukraine to try to inflict heavy and humiliating damages on Russia. If we were a well-functioning, mature democracy, this is part of what we would be debating as we approach national midterm elections. As opposed to that, on the one hand, we seem to be simply motivated by our understandable disgust and angst at what is happening in the Ukraine. And on the other hand, by the ongoing jockeying for partisan advantage. You may have seen the Republican leader in the House of Representatives tweeted out the other day, this is not a Putin gas price increase. This is a Biden gas price increase, right? Clearly false, indefensible, but even more revealing in terms of the degree to which our hyper-partisan polarization no longer stops at the border of our foreign policy. And in addition to, to the question about what we should be doing in the short term, in the Ukraine, how much should we be arming the Ukrainians? How large is the risk of escalation if we continue? And is that risk worth bearing, right? Very important questions. There's also the further question, right? It's now increasingly clear, as Thomas Friedman put it in an op-ed a while ago, that the leader of a superpower is a war criminal, right? And note that Russia has a seat on the Security Council. And so we should anticipate that the United Nations will become even more dysfunctional than it currently is. That Putin is in a sense green lighting aggression for other regimes. That the degree of global integration of the economy that has been characteristic of the post-Cold War period appears to be breaking down. That in a whole bunch of different ways, the norms and institutions governing international relations are shifting very quickly underneath our feet. Again, something we really ought to be talking about, but are apparently not going to be talking about. All we're going to be talking about is increased oil prices and a whole bunch of other stuff that frankly distracts us from the urgent stuff. Uh, QAnon trolling, right? Uh, don't say gay legislation in Florida, anti-critical race theory, this politics of anxiety and grievance focused on children. And then serious but lamentable, the campaign to replace local officials with those who adhere to the idea that the 2020 election was decided by fraud and who seem to be committed to potentially not accurately registering the results of future elections if they do not turn out the way they want to turn out. And by the way, this will be another election in which there will be yet another round of efforts to restrict access to the ballot and then an increased need to mobilize access for or, or to, to mobilize voters to gain access if they are going to overcome the impediments put in their place. All right, I kind of sprinted through all of that with apologies because uh, Ruth has, has proposed that we spend a minute um, talking about the recent stories in the Chronicle about uh, Diane Feinstein, the Senator from California and whether or not she is experiencing memory 
loss of a kind that incapacitates her to perform her duties. And as you can see, Feinstein, and, and thank you to John Campbell for, for uh, sharing these stories with me, Feinstein has, has pushed back as have Pelosi and others. And I just wanna point out to you, I actually just got a, a, a Mellon grant to do some further research in the field of lifelong learning, which as you know, is something I'm quite passionate about. There's a whole long literature and, and very quickly, it emphasizes a few different things. The first is that we are living longer, right? And that as we are living longer, the customary idea that after a certain age, one steps away from work and responsibilities and instead uh, retires, quote unquote, from the usual activities of the world, is being challenged, right? And, and, and there is a, a, a big literature about the way in which we can maintain our cognitive functionality much later in life, the way in which if we stay engaged in the world, that that can promote long-term cognitive health. Um, and also literature on ageism, the way in which in a sense, we all wanna think of ourselves as healthy and vital, and therefore we tend to project incapacity onto those who are older. And, and that this, I think, situation with Feinstein gives us a chance not only to talk about her, but maybe <clears throat> to also talk about some of these deeper issues. So with that being said, why don't I open it up to discussion either the stuff that we've uh, talked about in the lecture or the Feinstein situation. And, and let me just ask, did I succeed in getting us to a place where we're all seeing each other's faces now? Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, okay, good. So who, who wants to start us out with discussion? R Ruth, you, you kind of nominated the Feinstein theme. Do you wanna start us out with what you were thinking about? Well, the thing that bothered me, whether she has memory problems or not, is that the Chronicle put her on the front page, big story, and then two other pages in the middle of the, of the paper. And essentially, it's a story that had all anonymous sources, the interviews, you know, they didn't use their names. And I think it belonged on the opinion page as an op-ed or something, not as the first page news story. I thought it shamed her. And I didn't think it would, uh, as she, her reply showed, it made her more defensive. So if the Democrats wanted uh, to do that in order to get her to resign, I don't think it had that effect. But mostly I was really appalled by the tone of the story and the fact that people didn't give their own names when they made these accusations. And I thought, I thought it was really shameful of the uh, Chronicle to do it that way. Well, right. this, this started because Ruth and I were talking about it and uh, <clears throat> my reaction was different. I, I'll just say this briefly and then other people I hope will have opinions. But uh, uh, to me, the question of whether, the, the, the story is largely framed in whether she's able to serve the people of California <clears throat> and, to me, that's kind of a secondary issue, but um, uh, there is a question of her, uh, of uh, the upcoming election. She's of course, in a, she's, she's in her seat until 2024, but um, the, I think it would be a political calculation, although never mentioned in this article that um, what will the Democrats look like uh, coming in she presumably won't run again, although she hasn't said she won't, but, but one can anticipate she won't run again. But uh, unless the Democrats can have a successful incumbent in that office going into the election, uh, they, might be, they might be quite vulnerable. So there's that political side of it as well. But I don't know, I said one thing I said to Ruth is, you know, politics ain't beanbag. I mean, if you're a senator, um, it's a little different than if you're taking some you know, distinguished person in the community or something uh, to, to make these remarks about. To me, if, if this many people, and I trust the Chronicle to say that this opinion is pretty widespread, if far from universal. And uh, uh, it seemed to me it's uh, quite responsible journalism to report that to the uh, voters of California. 
And so I'll, I'll just say I, I, I'm inclined to, to probably agree more with John, not so much about um, the tone of the article or the placement of the article. I, I mean, it is investigative journalism, right? And so in, in a sense, it probably doesn't belong on the opinion page, but uh, did it deserve the prominence the Chronicle gave it? What What's the motivation on the part of the Chronicle? Is it salacious and therefore likely to sell more newspapers? And is it just that, or are they trying to get Feinstein out of office? Um, but, but leaving all of that stuff to one side, um, it, it, it does seem to me that there's been some evidence of, of, of Feinstein's diminished capacity going back four years. At least that's, that's what I was hearing in, I believe, 2017 around the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing. And, and obviously she has a very long standing record of service and has done some really important work for the city of San Francisco and the state of California and the country. I mean, I, the, the, the stuff that she did during the war on terror when she was uh, almost single-handedly reining in the national security state's use of FIFSO warrants to um, monitor our communications, I think is, is heroic and, 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 and should go down as a very proud moment in our history, right? Using the tools of government to stand up against our government. But having said that, if she is diminished, there's a duty for people to say that she's diminished if she can no longer play her role and that pivot from her case to the broader, I guess, issue here. Aging does for many or most of us result in a diminishment of our capacities, right? I mean, I would love to still be able to play basketball. I used to get great joy out of it. I'm not going to probably ever step on a basketball court again, except to take a few shots because I don't want to blow out my knees or damage my back. And I recognize at my age, if I start playing competitive basketball, that's what's going to happen to me, right? And, and so we adjust to the fact that our capacities are not what they used to be. And to be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with a woman of Diane Feinstein's age being a senator, so long as she is capable of fulfilling her duties. And we are some people, I don't know if you've seen this, this phrase being bantered about with the spread of COVID in Washington, DC right now. Some people refer to what we have as a gerontocracy in, in the United States right now, right? The average age of our leadership is older than it's been at any point in our history. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If the most competent, the most experienced, the most foresighted people in the leadership are older, then they should be in the leadership position, but they do need to have the capacities to do what their jobs demand of them. That, that's my initial take on this. David, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, David. Um, there you go. Oh, just for me, it's not even about ageism or whatever. I'd love to see an article talking about all the senators that have been impacted by their quote decline. <clears throat> but I think it, for me, it's more like a, a shot of fear that's been injected into the Democratic Republic, uh, Democratic Party, because this is just another one of the major steps of people, particularly at a very critical time. That's, it looks more like that to me. Yeah, I was, I was listening to what John was saying, and I'm not spending as much time in California as I used to. Boy, if the Democrats lose a senator from California in 2024, I, that, I, I mean, as, as you know, that means the party is in deep trouble, given um, how solidly Democratic the state has been for so <laughs> I don't know if there's a, a, a shift I'm unaware of occurring in California, but it, frankly, from afar, it seems almost inconceivable 
that irrespective of whether there's an incumbent or an open primary, that the Democrats would, would be in jeopardy in California. Am I missing something? I don't. I think that's correct. I think it's probably correct, but uh, generally speaking, uh, political parties tend to be more worried about that sort of thing than people standing on the outside looking at it. I think they would feel the need to have a strong candidate in that, in that race. So if Feinstein were to step down, Newsom would appoint an interim senator and of course, yeah. Newsom is not going to appoint himself. Maybe th that's one of the <laughs> background probably, issues here. Probably be tempted, but I don't think that's ever happened. Yeah, no, it would be <laughs> it would be a self inflicted wound if he did. All right, so so I'm not hearing a, a, a lot of appetite to to discuss Feinstein any further, unless I'm wrong. Um, and, and by the way, I showed you my little bookcase of the books I'm reading and I got this grant for next year. I will put together at some point a lecture series on these issues. And, and so there'll be an opportunity not to just kind of parachute in on the basis of a current scandal, but to, to really go into some depth on issues to do with ageism, with the distribution of care, with things that we can do to extend our functionality, vitality, and contribution as our lives last longer and longer. I, I do intend, might be a year from now, because my grant is not till next spring, but to, to, to go into these issues at greater length with you. In the meantime, inflation, et cetera, yeah, go ahead, Flossie. I can see you raising your hand. A bit of sentimental trivia, seeing how she is being represented on the on the pages of the Chronicle. I have a memory of her walking with her husband, her then husband, down one of the hills in Mount Tamil Choirs. Mm. My husband and I were walking up they were coming down. And I remember how graciously she smiled at us. A um, big deal, but it saddens me to see her brought so low. Yeah. And, and I think some of you know, my mother is suffering from Alzheimer's and it, it, it's never, never an easy situation when the capacity you lose is your cognitive capacity, right? Who, uh, none of us really know what's going on with Feinstein. There is a possibility that she's diminished by the loss of her husband and that she may be able to come back. I, I'm not going to speculate on that, but, but it is awful to see it happen in such a public way, assuming it is a cognitive decline we're, we're witnessing. John, go ahead. Well, I agree with that, but the the Chronicle story did make quite a point to say that the story was in preparation well before her husband died, and the interviews that they're talking about were, were carried out before her husband died. Good yeah, and, and there were uh, stories circulating, I think, in 2017 around the Kavanaugh uh, yeah. and confirmation hearings that Feinstein was no longer as commanding a presence as she had been. Uh, up until that point. John, uh, I'm sorry, David, go ahead. I don't even know how, <clears throat> excuse me, how to address this one. But one of the things I'd like to uh, look at again is, for instance, this woman who got five years for voting improperly versus yeah. Mark Meadows and so on. How do we ever bring about the, this massive disparity that we somehow tolerate, you know, I mean, to bring about confusion, if nothing else. But that'd be something I'd like for us, not just in that case, not just about voting, but a number of issues like that. Is that something we could look at? Um, sure, uh, not today. Uh, no. And um, I want to say in certain respects, I guess it was two summers ago, I gave a lecture series on racial inequality in the United States. And I spent a fair bit of time looking at sentencing disparities 
with regards to race and not just sentencing disparities, right? It, at every stage in the criminal justice system, from who the police pays attention to, to uh, who is likely to actually be charged, to what they're going to be charged with, to who gets decent counsel, there are systematic inequalities, many of which follow along traditional racial lines in, in our criminal justice system, right? And, and I don't know if you've been seeing, um, th there's a growing number of cities that are eliminating um, the ability of police officers to pull over motorists for minor infractions, like a taillight being out. Right. And, and, and on the idea that these things often escalate, let's just not go with that line of law enforcement. I really should have put this on, on, on my uh, culture war issue list, which I tick through very quickly. Growing crime in the United States is, is, is there as well. And I'll, I'll just point out to you, it's, it's, it's not just um, who gets into the grasp of the criminal justice system and what happens to them when they get in and the asymmetries there. It's also the case that we are systematically confused about crime in the United States. And it is true that crime is going up, but it's also true that it's going up from a 50 year low in a very small way, right? And, and, and the most Americans, the, the data is very clear, overestimate the amount of crime in their area and the average overestimation is by around eight times. We think there's eight times as much crime as there actually is, right? And um, that reflects the way our news covers crime, right? And, and by the way, that's not the case in other societies. And in other societies, people are not as confused about the rate of crime. Uh, so so there, yeah, there's some interesting issues to talk about there, David. Um, I'm not quite sure when we'll get to them, but I'm making a note and, and I'll try to circle back, okay? All right, everybody, take care, be safe, have good weeks. And uh, by the way, I, I, I liked what Ruth did in terms of, of reaching out to me and saying, there's something we're talking about. Why don't we talk about it together on Saturday? If you have anything you wanna discuss, you can also let me know or let Amy know and she'll pass it along, okay? All right, everybody, take care. See you soon, bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Bye, guys. Bye.